the Vehicular Technology Society for giving me the chance to make this job. It was a really a pleasure, an honor, and a privilege to be able to work with them and try to do our best to give you the chance to attend an, a conference, a well-organized conference. This conference covers a very nice, very uh, variety of technology um, topics. So it was also interesting for me to see what the several papers were, were dealing on. I need also to thank all the staff of University of Florence, uh, Gabriele and Luca are here. They give a, gave an important contribution for the work of the conference. One of the nice things the board of vehicular technology conference made is to choose the right place and the right time. Today is summertime, it's the very days, the very first day of summer. So the place is here. You are next to downtown Florence. So every nice place to be visited in Florence is in a walking distance from here. The railway station is next to us. So if you would like to go, let's say to Pisa, you can pick up a train and go there. I would rather suggest you to stay in Florence. <laughs> and also they choose the right days because these are the longest days in the year here in Florence. And also they are very hot days. So you can stay at the conference when it's hot and the very first day, very first hours of the morning and in the afternoon when the conference work, job works are over, you can go and visit the monuments. So you can do both. That's it. I don't want to bother you with so many more talks. I wish you a very, very good work here. And uh, I'm sure that you will have very, very good and nice time. Now, as you, all of you know, Florence is a nice place to, for tourists to come. So we decided to give a travel awards. <laughs> Me. So I would come call here the, the guys who won the, these awards. Um, I'm calling them, all of them? Okay. So please, I would ask to come here on the, on the stage a Tanaka, sorry for the pronunciation of the name, it is not so familiar to me. Kisht Bansal. Yu Quin Tian. Rajini Verma. Bashar Anad. Ahmed Bakar. Mohamed Bello Aliu. Kumia Ojika, Young Wan Na, and Azako Shigenawa. So, congratulations to all of them for their presentation. They achieved this award because of their job. As you can see, all of them are young people and we are really trust on young people. Okay.
Uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Gabriele Maria Lozito and I'm from the Technical Program Committee. I would like to give you my welcome as well here today in Florence. And uh, uh, honestly, I would like to take a moment to give a, a list of thank you to a very long list of people and I'll try to make a short work of it because we do not have much time and do not want to take time for the uh, technical presentations, but uh, I've been working together with uh, uh, so, so many people that allow to make this uh, conference edition a success. I say it is a success because we received more than 800 contribution and after uh, a lot of work and making a lot of difficult decision because uh, each contribution was unique in uh, its own way, we are able today to present to you about 540 contributions presented at this forum. So this was a, a very big success uh, in our opinion. Uh, the thanks goes, of course, uh, to the organizing committee, to the technical committee, and of course, the conference committee for uh, all their guidance uh, or their help uh, and all the hard work that they provided during this year. Then, of course, uh, I need to make a more personal thank you to the, to the dream team of the track chairs, which managed to stay behind the deadlines and secure three reviews for each of the 800 contributions that we received it was an amazing job. They did it in a timely manner. And after this, they even helped us with uh, organizing the papers into the technical sessions and even perform the recruiting process for the session chairs. So thank you a lot to all the track chairs and sorry for the repeated emails. I'm sure that it, I'm in somebody's spam list at this point, but they were really, really precious in their help. Of course, I would like to thank the TPC members and each and every reviewer that helped us because with their help, we were able to assess the quality of this large number of manuscripts and give to you today only the best. Lastly, my thanks goes to the authors and the speakers. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you for the knowledge that you will share with your peers. Thank you for being the scientific backbone of this community. So uh, without taking much more time, uh, as it is customary, it is my privilege, my honor to present to you the awards for the authors that presented the most outstanding papers to this conference. And uh, I'm going to start by presenting to you the paper that received the uh, best student paper award, which is titled, Predictive network configuration with hierarchical spectral clustering for software defined vehicles. Uh, there are uh, the author Sarah, sorry for the pronunciation, Pierre Laclau, Stellantis, and Udiasic, uh, Stefan Bonnet, University Udiasic, sorry, uh, and Bertrand Ducol, uh, Xioting Li, Tristalin. And Velisi Villa Cublé. Sorry, I, I hope that I pronounced everybody correctly. <laughs> uh, just a few words. This work was praised by the reviewers uh, for the choice of the problem from the authors. It is a very well known NPR problem. And they praised the, the, the methodology and the mathematical soundness that they used for the solution of it. And uh, uh, an interesting thing is that uh, they, their approach was energy efficient. So they took an eye also to the environmental friendliness of their solution. The paper is going to be presented tomorrow afternoon in the session, Recent Results in Vehicular Communication. And uh, at this point, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Pierre Laclau to join us on stage so that I can uh, give him the award for him and his quarters. Please come here. Please. Okay, and uh, following, we are presenting as well the best conference paper award, which goes to uh, measurement based characterization of physical layer security for risk assisted wireless system. And uh, the authors are Samet Kezir, Sefa Kailuki, 
Ibrahim Hoklek, Ali Emre Kuzan, uh, Ertuga Bazar, Ali Gorsin, and uh, uh, so apart from the exceptional writing quality, the article was praised by the reviewers for the computational approach used for the phase shift antenna elements definition to an optimization algorithm, which basically saved them from an exhausting search approach. And uh, uh, also by the care that was taken by the authors uh, to implement uh, a very sound and meaningful experimental validation workbench to validate the results. Uh, the paper is going to be presented tomorrow morning in the session on assisted communication, and I would like to invite Dr. Samit Kazir to join us on stage, please. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, again, uh, my congratulations to the people that won the award and uh, I, I'm finished and uh, I will leave the floor to the VTS president for a few words. Thank you very much to everyone. Okay, good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Vehicular Technology Society, it is my great honor and a pleasure to welcome you to this 1907th ITP Vehicular Technology Conference, VTC 2023 Spring, in this beautiful city, Florence in Italy. This semi-annual ITP VTS flagship conference brings together individuals from academia, industry, and also government to discuss and exchange ideas in the fields of wireless, mobile, and vehicular technology. It provides you a unique platform to network with leading researchers and colleagues in the global technical community to share your innovative ideas and thoughts for wireless communications and the vehicular technology. And to benefit from the conference premier program that features cutting edge and the achievements of the international community. Your active participation in this conference will help to define and shape the future of wireless communications, connected vehicles and the autonomous driving technology in beyond the 5G and in 6G areas. Organizing this world-class conference requires a strong team of volunteers who have devoted both their time and their te technical expertise. I want to take this opportunity to thank and congratulate the whole conference organization team led by BTS Vice President for con conferences J.R. Cruz, the conference general co-chairs are Bota Rieti and Lorenzi Siani, and the technical program committee co-chairs, Gabriel Maria Rosito, uh, Fabri Fabio Cotti, Ruiz, Luis Ginis, Alicia Trivino, Luca Pucci, and uh, Salvatore Musumesi. The conference organization committee has been working diligently in planning and running this conference with excellent technical programs, tutorials, workshops, and industry checks. We highly appreciate their great efforts. The success of this conference is also due to the generous support of all the sponsors. IHB VTS has been successful in engaging the global technical community and in contributing to advances in vehicular technologies in the areas of mobile radio, motor vehicles, and the land transportation. In recent years, it has been promoting R&D activities in the 5G and the beyond communication systems in autonomous, connected, and uh, electric vehicles and in intelligent ground transportation infrastructures. 
Building on the momentum, the VTS strive to listen to our members for your needs, to be creative and work hard on various existing programs and new initiatives towards a stronger society. If you are not a VTS member or a VTS student member, it's a good idea to consider joining VTS today to benefit from all the services and resources that VTS provides and to contribute to the community. Finally, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to everyone for attending this conference. And I wish you all a great time at this VTC. Thank you, everyone. Um, next, um, on behalf of the Vehicular Technology Board of Governors, it's my great pleasure to present you uh, present the General Co-Chair Awards to Alberta Rieti and Lorenzo Ciani. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next, again, it's my great pleasure to present Technical Program Co-Chair Award to, I want to read all the names, Gabriel Maria Lozito, Fabio Cotti, Luis Denise, Alicia Trevino, Luca Tucci, and uh, Salvatore Muzu Messi. Congratulations. Um, So, oh, thank you. Thank you. So, next, I'm handing it over to uh, Lyle Hanzo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, very warm welcome to you. Uh, my name is Lajos Hanzo. I teach and research at Southampton University in the UK, and I've been busy compiling a keynotes program for you. So it's my great privilege to introduce the first keynote speaker of this conference, my good old friend, uh, Professor Harald Haas. We go back uh, way over two decades, and uh, he's got uh, a very interesting mixed industrial and academic background. And uh, he did a first degree back in Germany, then uh, he moved to the United Kingdom, got his PhD at Edinburgh University, joined industry. Then uh, he went to academia at Bremen University. And uh, then eventually he returned to the UK to take up a chair at Edinburgh University. And so he has had this, this amazing amalgam of industrial and academic experience, and that has pervaded all his research throughout the past decades. And so he, his credentials include a huge number of influential papers, but also uh, almost um, 50 or so patents over the years. And so he also started a company called uh, Pure Li-Fi, and he's been pioneering this very interesting optical wireless area of our field. And so he's one of those pioneers who really always kind of finds the next idea, never really getting stale in his research. And so today he will be talking to us about uh, the role of uh, optical wireless in uh, potential 
uh, kind of avenues for the next generation. And indeed, the whole conference is, of course, all about an amalgam of ideas for this uh, next wave of research, which we call 6G. And so we very much look forward to what you have to say for us, Harald, on this uh, very interesting frontier research subject. So join me in welcoming Harald to the platform, and we much look forward to listening to you. Lajos, thank you very much for these very warm words and uh, can only echo what you said. It's been a great uh, honor to be a friend for many, many years, decades, in fact. So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's my absolute pleasure to be here and giving the opening keynote. And I really like to thank VTC and, and the organizing committee for, for giving me that opportunity, the platform to, to talk to you a little bit around optical wireless communication, so slightly different from radio, but also part of the family. But I think it's an, it's an area where I think we see a great potential when we go forward into 6G and future networks. So let me, let me start. And I, I basically try to motivate why that additional spectrum is needed. And uh, I start with, with the physical world, the real world, the where we are, we are here in. And that's basically our platform. This is where all things happen. But then you, you look at the things as they go forward, we see a big trend in future networking and, um, and, and, and services around bringing in robots, bringing autonomous machines, bringing in the autonomous, autonomous car, eventually the drones. So really, and you see here, BBC forecasts that in, in, in a 10 years from now, basically almost 40% uh, of our boring work at home is taken over by robots, by cobots that basically cook our meals and uh, wash our clothes and, uh, and, and iron our, our shirts. So I, this, is, this is a vision that is, that is coming. So we are really at the verge, what people call the metaverse or the, the cyber physical continuum. And there are two big trends within that. One is in, in our view, is really the autonomous system I've mentioned already. And the, the other one is really we want to map the real world, the physical world into the cyber world in order to optimize things that operate within the real world and, and really emulate and, and uh, project uh, trends and also um, create new opportunities. Uh, so that really means we, we are really at the verge of bringing in computation, communications and sensing in amalgamated with intelligence. And, and that, um, that really drives our really intelligent world going forward. And what we as sort of wireless communications or communications engineers have to contribute to that is really building the ultimate nervous system, the nervous system that really connects everything. So if I, if I, look, if I look what that could be, you see here within these robots or robots at home, they are full of sensors and they have to be full of sensors. And here you see a recent sort of a bionic hand by a group at Cambridge University, which has a soft material and, and as you see a lot of sensors integrated in order to make the touch and sensing as human like as possible. But you see a lot of cable within that hand and what is if we can replace these cables by sort of wireless connectivity so wireless comes goes into these robots, but also it goes beyond and we look into the the really fully immersed uh, sort of cyber world. We see the trend of AR, VR has been around for a long time, but eventually we'll have these uh, mixed reality glasses in front of us that allow us to be in a real world uh, as well as in, in a cyber world. But that requires connectivity. And you see many of those are still tethered, tethered, but we need to really get these things operating. And then going up to the next level, I think we need to also build networks that connect everything everywhere. And uh, we still have these sort of uh, issues around digital divide, the inclusion, uh, and in order to make that real transition into that new world. So we need to integrate cyber, uh, satellite comms, satellite to satellite, satellite to ground, sort of drones and, and so on, requires big challenges in building networks. And then we need to, in our physical world, also think about I mean, space, maybe deep space, if we're going to Mars, we need to look at terrestrial uh, communications, but there's also a, a big play underwater to be had in building networks that allow remote operated vehicles underwater to communicate. And um, on that, we need connectivity. And I think um, optical wireless communications plays a role here as well. So we see 
the full breadth of work. So bringing that together, I think trying to summarize what, what does it mean for us? I mean, I, I see essentially four big challenges that really govern the future networks is, is capacity. And I mean, capacity is the link capacity, but also the area data rate. So the connectivity of these multiple sensors, these millions of sensors and devices. And then we talk about efficiency and, and that has been around for a long time. You need to more, be more energy efficient. That's really important given sort of uh, the, the global crisis on, on, on climate um, and the energy consumption of uh, electric, electricity consumption of um, wireless systems or communication systems is still in the region of 10% globally. So we need to get that down as well as being more spectrum efficient. Um, and I'll come to that in a minute. And then the availability in mean, the networks need to be available on essentially almost on cell level within your body and on sort of um, outer space level. So that creates um, these, these tremendous um, opportunities and then has to be more secure. And that is really important because when we build a nervous system, we don't want to have anyone tapping into that nervous system and do something with these sort of uh, cobots and robots uh, potentially harmful. So that's, that's really the, the, the four major themes that can't be developed in isolation anymore. So we can't only think of getting, getting closer to Shannon. We need to make sure that all the things are co-developed jointly. Uh, and and um, I'm, I'm trying to show you that optical wireless communications is a tool that allows us doing that. So let's basically dwell a little bit on these uh, four items. Um, capacity, I mean, we, we know that. And now um, we're looking, I mean, looking ahead. At the moment, we have two dimensional displays, not there's a trend of going into holographic displays, making displays three dimensional. And there's uh, studies out there, you've seen that paper, if, if you go to a holographic display with an with, which requires about 19 uh, gigapixels, and if you have sort of updates rate that allow you to, to have sort of normal gesture recognition and normal gesture um, stimulation, and then you look at the data rates here around terabit per second for a device like that. And if you basically simple math, if you have a system that is uh, spectrum efficient at 10 bits per second per hertz, then you need 100 gigahertz. And that's, that's a true, true, true fact. And the question is, how do we find that? And where do we find that? The answer lies somewhere here in the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's the, the, the core of my talk. Um, so we look at obviously the radio spectrum up to 300 gigahertz, which is also sort of touching upon the terahertz spectrum. But then there is this optical spectrum ranging from infrared, visible light, and also ultraviolet light. It's also uh, used and has particular advantages for outdoor communications. But let's focus on infrared and visible light. It's about 3,000 times or 2,600 times bigger in terms of spectrum availability compared to the entire 300 gigahertz of radio spectrum. But some of you may now say, okay, I've missed something here in the middle. Uh, it, it's a terahertz spectrum, which is a spectrum band looked at for 6G. But if there's still a few challenges to be overcome in the terahertz region, which is sort of the power gap, we need to find devices that allow um, output powers that are usable and sensible for wireless applications. At the moment, they are these devices are basically sub one milliwatt optical output power, and it's really hard to think about using that devices for sort of long haul communications, let alone indoor or indoor access. So there's, a, there's room for terahertz, but I think it, um, it, it, it may come in certain stages, but I think in the infrared and the visible light, given the tremendous developments in fiber optical communications, there are tremendous devices and useful devices out there we can use and include in our optical wireless systems. So since the spectrum is now about 3000 times larger than the entire radio spectrum, so the, the question is less about, can we be more spectrum efficient? Do we need to go to 4K QAM? Or can we basically use very simple modulation schemes like on-off keying, which is basically on and off, which is one of the most energy efficient uh, modulation schemes. It's like a class D power amplifier. Can we use more of these less spectrum efficient and basically shift the focus more on building energy efficient modulation techniques. And there's a lot of development around that use, but that additional spectrum allows us to think about uh, those new modulation techniques that are more energy efficient. 
So now if you, if you ask, okay, if we have this tremendous amount of additional spectrum, can we really harness it for wireless communications? And I, the, the, the answer to that is yes, but it's a big but as well. For example, if you use a white light source, a white LED, uh, you, what you usually have is a blue LED that basically shines light on a phosphor plate and the phosphor converts sort of blue light into yellow light and yellow and blue recombine into white. But that light basically occupies the entire spectrum. So there's basically um, a, a, an a ultra wideband transmitter if you want. So that's not what we want. We want to have um, usage of the uh, individual wavelengths. And um, there's another problem that comes our way is that we have to have these devices like lasers, like LEDs that convert the optical spectrum into an electrical spectrum. So it's the optical electrical conversion that slows down the frequency response. So if you're looking at a, a laser, it has bandwidth anywhere between five gigahertz and 50 gigahertz, that's the electrical bandwidth. Now the, the question really is, um, if we look at the optical spectrum, so how, how how um, sharp can we uh, shape the spectrum? Now, if you, and then how that how relate how does that relate to the electrical bandwidth? And uh, if you look at the infrared, for example, you see an emission of uh, 0.4 nanometer of uh, sort of bandwidth in the, in the in the optical domain that would correspond at 1500 nanometer to around 50 gigahertz of electrical bandwidth. And the 50 gigahertz is actually the uh, the channel spacing in fibercom. So that is therefore very, very nicely matched. If you were to use a, also an 0.4 nanometer spectrum in the blue range, so in the, in the visible light, that would correspond to a, a, a bandwidth requirement of the electrical device of close to 500 gigahertz. So there is no blue laser, and no device that has an electrical bandwidth of 500 gigahertz. And that is where sort of research on the device level is driven, getting higher electrical bandwidth or completely eliminate the optical electrical conversion, have an all optical network. And there's, there's, there's initiatives in the world that's, that's they are trying to do that. Um, in Japan, the um, innovative, innovative optical wireless network, IOWN, so the initiatives tries to achieve that all optical, but at the moment, still having to live with this sort of conversion inefficiency. But nonetheless, we have these wavelengths. So we have RGB LEDs. So we have already very coarse uh, sort of bandwidth um, um, separation. And uh, the good thing is that the, uh, the, the colors are pre-locked, so it scales linearly, like the MIMO gain, we have the WDM gain in that system as well. And that's something we really want and have exploited. So the idea really is build a system like this, have n times the, say, five to 10 gigahertz of bandwidth, and that's how we can scale the system capacity. Now, the question is, if you have 10 wavelengths, you need 10 lasers. Uh, it's a huge effort to put that into a, an access point. Um, luckily, there's very nice developments on the device level here. Uh, a group in, in Norway has come up with this really uh, in ingenious device, which is a ring resonator. It's pumped by a single laser and it has a, a comp structure so that um, there are about 1,000 different wavelengths coming out of this device that can be individually modulated. And you see the comp structure there at a spacing of about one nanometer. So if you imagine you have a, you have a thousand times MIMO, in this case, WM, and then you can individually modulate these, uh, these different wavelengths. And they have shown 1.8 petabit uh, capability with this device, currently for fiber comps, but I can see a clear path applying that in the, uh, in the optical wireless world. So you see that the door is really wide open for capacity. Now, maybe uh, breaking it down a little bit further into a really what does it mean to modulate sort of these intensity sources. So while there is a possibility to have coherent optical wireless, and we've done, we've done the PhD student has done this for three years, and it's, it's doable, but it's very complex. At the moment, the, the way sort of intensity sources are modulated is very simple. You bias an LED or a laser with a current source, and then you, you basically tap into with a bias T, your, your AC signal that changes the current of the device. And that is a linear, almost linear relationship between the current you feed in and the optical intensity you get out. That's your modulator, your mixer, if you want. But we need that bias. And that means we need to um, basically bias the, the system at some middle range of the 
transfer characteristic, which in a downing is a good thing because that DC bias gives you constant illumination, illumination sort of for, for the room when you use visible light. And on top of that bias, you have the um, sort of the data carrying signal in this case, uh, OFDM sort of um, it's, a, it's a Gaussian signal in the time domain. Uh, and, and we operated around that, that, that point. So there, there is that limitation. So the, the question is when you do that for the uplink, you don't want to waste that power to illuminate. So you need to get that uh, DC bias down to the turn on voltage, but then you clip a lot of the, the, the your OFDM signal, so you don't want that. So there's ways, however, that you can create a purely positive OFDM frame. Um, usually co comes at a cost of a spectrum efficiency, but there's, there's papers out there that use sort of um, 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 multi-stream uh, uh, sort of communications with um, um, superposition modulation that would allow you then with iterative interference cancellation to recover some of the, the losses, but don't have, sadly not, don't have the time to go into all of this, but there's ways of really also reducing the DC bias and make it more um, energy efficient for the uplink. So really uh, we op modulate around that. It's intensity modulation, direct detection, the, 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 bay, the, the wavelength, we're not having any intermediate frequency. So that therefore, there is, there is no hardly no Doppler effect in that. So you can use it in very high speed environments. And also as we are using intensity modulation uh, and, um, and the fact that the detector is much, much larger than the, the wavelength, you don't have any fast fading. So it is it's a really fading free and also Doppler free sort of channel. Uh, and it gives us a, a lot of opportunities around building more sort of resistant, uh, resilient systems and also going into the realm of channel prediction. And that if we can do channel prediction in, in, in conjunction with mapping, we can do more predictive resource allocations. And all of these things um, we see really nicely possible with that, with that, with that technology. So I'll show you uh, one, one example here um, of a WDM system that, that we have um, developed with, with, a, with a partner in, uh, in Santa Barbara. I mean, we know all Shushi Nakamura, he's got the Nobel Prize for the blue LED. Interestingly, the same person now is basically revolutionizing lighting in the sense that they are building these devices that you see on the left that are not driven by a blue LED, but a blue laser. So the, the SMD device that they've built, uh, Kyocera SMD laser, is essentially a, a laser shining on top of a, of a phosphor plate. And then there's the opportunity for a second laser in there as an infrared laser. In fact, you can build four different lasers within that single device. We have a four channel device. Here I'll show you two. Um, and we've taken 10 of these devices, have modulated the, uh, the light sources and have built a MIMO system that you see at the bottom right there. You see the fibers coming out of these SMD devices. They are spliced together into a single fiber with a launch optics that is that sort of transmitter, the light source in the, the top middle bar part, emitting white light. So we have uh, the, the blue wavelengths coming through as well as multiple infrared wavelengths. And use, we use WDM here. And then you see at the receiver, a bank of 10 receivers with different filters. Uh, optical filters and have 10 wavelengths operating here at roughly about 10 gigabit per second per wavelength. So the aggregate data rate in that demonstration uh, was 105 gigabit per second. And again, shown at CES in Las Vegas last year. A year. And, and that is basically our first contribution to a 6G demonstrator. So showing really capability of 100 gigabit per second. Then <clears throat> I want to come to the point as well, um, if saying, okay, you're building TV remote controls on steroids. You need to basically have line of sight and all things working. It wouldn't work if that isn't the case. Uh, what I wanted to show you here is it, it, it is, operates like a, a normal, in quotes, normal wireless system that obviously we have line of sight components as we have here with this down lighter, sending data to that sort of receive in the front connected to the, the laptop. In this case, streaming a video. Here you see the, 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 the black circle is the uplink infrared filter for the infrared uplink. So very nice pointed transmission and we stream the video. 
So what we do now is we turn around that light source and basically turn a direct line of side channel into a non line of side channel and you see this adaptive modulation coding happened. Now the modulation format has changed and all the reflecting light is now still sufficient to transmit that video so. Uh, what I wanted to, to illustrate with this is um, we can operate as well in non line of sight scenarios, albeit at a lower data rate, uh, like like most RF systems. But then if you look into a real world deployment, if you look at the ceiling, you have a very nice representation of a cellular structure. So these, these lights are in, in a nice sort of uh, hexagonal shape. And this is a massive MIMO sort of scenario of a, of, of a transmitter. Um, system of a, a, a multiple access points and we are modeled this year with the sort of random blockers which are these sort of cylinders and then we have that cylinder in the front that with a black square that's a smartphone so we now let this person move through in this in this environment and monitor how many line of sight connections we'll have in that scenario and line of sight here is illustrated by a green dotted uh, line red is a non line of sight so blocked connection and you see uh, that the independent uh, of movement pattern and and um, and uh, position, there's always a line of sight connection somewhere. So really gives us room to build really uh, powerful comp cooperative multipoint transmission systems that basically make sure that we have reliable communications regardless of the orientation and regardless of the the, the location. Now, if going back to the other question that might arise from this and saying, okay, you may have all the infrastructure done, but how do you get it into your phone? Um, and now I'm coming here with, with my sort of a, a company uh, hat on. So um, Pure Li-Fi has recently launched at Mobile World Congress, this little module that you see here, uh, which is around the size of a camera module. It has an infrared transmitter and a, and a, and a photo detector. Uh, is capable of one gigabit per second uh, and also is compliant with a newly established IEEE 802.11 BB standard, which is an extension of, of course, of the, the wireless uh, Wi Fi family. But there's a standard in place, there's components in place, there's technology in place. So we believe there's a lot of ecosystem components now ready to have that technology basically scaled up. Um, and, and basically demonstrate its viability. Uh, we think it's a crucial time as, as we are now discussing 6G. Now going forward and saying, okay, um, how, how, can we, how can we really build systems that have sort of aggregate capacities of terabit per second? That's our ultimate goal. And that's what we do with a big program grant in, in the UK called TAUS, Terabit Optical Wireless Systems which is a partnership between sort of um, universities of uh, Edinburgh, Strathclyde, um, King's College London, and Cambridge and Bath. So the, the, the way we approach this here is we move away from using visible light, we're using infrared for both uplink and downlink. And we are building that on, on, on a grid of beam approach and using VIXELs, so vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, they are all in all your laptops, they are in all your phones for face recognition, for LIDAR applications. And you can build these devices very small size in an array. And we've built here sort of an, an array of 25 of these uh, laser transmitters on a three-dimensional structure, with basically a pyramid with the top cupped off. So we have nine planes, we have, have nine times 25 transmitters, so 225 beams that slightly point in different directions. And what we create, as you see here, is, a, is the ultimate small cell system in a room where every laser beam is a cell and the cell size is 40 centimeter. So if you remember so 2G, the, the cell maximum cell radius was 35 kilometers for mobile telephony. Now we've brought it down to uh, 40 centimeter. And what that means is a number of things. People can, can have their private cell, so we can really harness space division multiple access in its best beautiful form because of the directionality of light. There's no spread, so it's very nicely confined. And it allows us also to be more energy efficient because we don't have to switch on all the beams. We beam switch on the beams that are needed. And if people move, 
Well, fine. Uh, so what we, we have sort of beam tracking. So uh, we will activate the beam in, in, when a, a user moves into a neighboring cell. So we have dynamic beam uh, um, sort of um, allocation. That's where COM plays a role as well. And, and we use the, the, the electrical bandwidth of these devices that are five gigahertz and up to 50 gigahertz to build a system. And then, as I said, beam form is a big, big deal, but in optics is the form being deal uh, beams, you don't need an array of antennas. You don't need phase shifters. You don't need phase coherent superposition. All you need is a, is a lens. In this case, for example, a plano convex lens that costs less than a, a euro. And then you can decide which lens you use in order to create a beam pattern from that, uh, from that array. And for our case, basically we selected one of these lenses. You can buy it off the shelf, giving you a sort of multiple cells, multiple beams with minimum overlap and, and maximum coverage. And then you can build your, your system model. I'm not going into details, um, just saying the bandwidth is five gigahertz and then build a noise model. And the noise model is slightly different from RF because we have thermal noise and we have shot noise, which is a uh, sort of a random uh, sort of component in the optics and the relative intensity noise of a laser as well. So building that model, and then we can build the ESINR and then use uh, some of Andreas Goldsmith's work to approximate the data rate uh, based on a, a sort of a certain BR uh, that we can tolerate. And that, that gives us of the data rates. And if you plot that in that system, you see now the cellular system and the data rates you would get. Um, on the left, you see the SINR. On the right, you see um, the, uh, the SNR plot. And interestingly, we see these sort of 225 peaks peaking at 20 gigabit per second in the cell center. Um, and also at the, the cells at the boundary still give you 10 gigabit per second. But the worrying bit here is the blue bit because the blue means no data rate. So you may be three centimeters away from the cell center and suddenly your, your data rate drops dramatically. So that's in, in contradiction what I said earlier about making reliable sort of services. But I want to note a few more things here is the, the data rate that the power per laser is 10 milliwatt and it's completely within the eye safety limit. The aggregate power of that device of that system is two watt. That means all of the beams are activated, but we won't activate all of them. If we were to, the, the optical power is two watt and the aggregate data rate is, is about two terabit per second. At this stage, we have to worry about the backhaul, but let's take one step by the other, but there's this, this, this capacity available. Now, addressing the point of interference, um, and that can be really easily solved uh, because we have 225 degrees of freedom in this case. It's our choice how we cluster the cell. We can say a single beam is a cell, or we can say four beams are a cell, or we can say 25 beams are a cell, or we can say nine. So we have a, 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 a huge uh, sort of a, space uh, in terms of permutations, how we arrange these cells. And typically with the directionality of light, we know where the users are, and that's one of the, the prerequisites. And then we can use that. So example, if, if we did the cell clustering in these different scenarios, you see that the blue interference regions, they move, they move around, depending on how we cluster our cells. So basically we, <laughs> there's room for a new way of interference alignment. So we can shape the cell such that the interference falls into the nil region of the space, actually where nobody sits. And using machine learning in AI to do this a dynamic clustering of cells is something we are working on at the moment and really avoiding interference and basically shifting the, 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 the data rate to where the users are is something that, that is possible with that, with that uh, approach. I want to spend a little bit uh, of time on the, on the receiver as well, because that is often forgotten, but actually it's the most crucial part of the system. And there's um, one, one law that really bothers us, and, and this is the, uh, the conservation of étendue, which basically means that uh, there's a relationship between the aperture of your optical systems, in this case, a concentrator, and the field of view. And that product is constant, and that's what it says. It basically can be derived by the second law of thermodynamics, but et on do never, never, um, never increase, never decreases. So it's always increasing, like like entropy. So if we do that, so we we have we have a certain option. So we 
if we, you see on the right a concentrator that basically is giving you the antenna gain in this case, and the ratio between the aperture that where the light goes in as in divided by the aperture where light goes out as out, that ratio is, is the optical gain. If you want to have a high optical gain, you would need to have a large sort of input aperture. That, however, means that your field of view is very narrow. And that's in contradiction to what we want. We don't want to have a narrow field of view of our uh, uh, receiver embedded into a phone. So that means we need to accept low gain. And that gives us trade-offs. But if we have low gain, that means we need to have a large detector, a large photo detector in order to connect enough photons. But a large uh, photo detector means low bandwidth because it's a big capacitor. So it's a dilemma, a dilemma that, that, that arises. And maybe this is shown here in this graph where on the left you see the, the bandwidth of a photo detector versus the, the, the size of the detector. And that is that sort of inversely proportional, uh, inversely behaving uh, shape. The smaller the area, the bigger the bandwidth. But then if we go and want a certain field of view, say 10 degrees, and we fix sort of the output aperture, so that's the size of our detector, and then, then we get a certain limit limited um, um, gain that we could accept and that gain also translated into the height of the um, of the compound semi uh, compound uh, parabolic concentrator and usually you end up in a, in a, in a big height so you don't want to have a, a sort of a, a, a big optical system of three centimeter integrated in your smartphone so that's another problem to solve around that so we have approached that problem and solved that problem by going sort of cellular at a receiver, if you want, building what's called a, uh, um, a grid of beam, an array of array structure with, with uh, multiple of these optical concentrators arranged in a, in a group, in a cluster. So we, we basically cluster them in a single receiver, multiple receivers and, and different rings around the, the center part. And at the at the output of each of the concentrators sits an array of detector, not a single detector, an array that allows us to make the, the size of the detector small, but still have a sufficient large area to collect light at the output of the concentrator. And then typically the intensity pattern is constant. So we use equal gain combining of all the different uh, sort of um, detector outputs and then take the equal gaining, uh, equal gain combined output into a maximum ratio combiner. And that forms our sort of hierarchical receiver structure. And, and, and uh, this allows us to have relatively, relatively narrow field of view per concentrator, but the sum of the concentrators gives us sort of this insect eye type of receivers we, we can build. And then you can, run, you can run simulations and you can do the analysis of so different trade-offs. So on the left, you see we have changed the, we have, we have a single tier receiver. So one in the middle and a ring around and then have changed the, uh, the, the array size at the back of a, four, of a concentrator from a two by two by eight by eight. Obviously the, the higher the area, the higher the, the array size, the higher the data rate. So if you go at 30 degrees uh, field of view, you end up at 25 gigabit per second. That's one way you can optimize the system. Or the other way is you can fix the detector array, say a two by two at the output of a concentrator and have multiple of these tiers. So go up to three tier, that's another way we can increase the data rate. So we have these different parameters to design our receiver to the space in which we want to build them and, and the, the, the um, applications we want. But that, that, is, that is a way you build a system that a receiver that is not only a pointed receiver, but really allows you to, to move. So a few words on efficiency. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, energy efficiency is one of the big themes and we, think while we can always improve the energy efficiency of our signal processing, there is this uh, what's called the Chavin's uh, paradox. The more energy efficient you make a communication system, the more it's used. And then the, the gain is basically offset by the, by the additional use. So we believe that a real way to uh, make communication systems more energy efficient is basically is to use um, renewable energies within the process of building these systems. Uh, in, in our case here, what we advocated is use solar cells as data receivers and energy harvesters. So noise becomes sort of useful energy in, in our case. Uh, so what you show here is, is, is a 
a little sort of signal, small signal model at a, at a bot, a bottom of a solar cell. And then we bit put sort of an equalizer an analog equalizer next to it. And we have two branches that are coming out of the solar cell. It's a data branch and also an energy branch. And then we've done some studies here, for example, uh, what happens if you have strong sunlight on the solar panel? How, what's the behavior in terms of uh, the uh, receiving capability and the data receiving capability? And you see the more intensity, light intensity is on the solar cell, the, the, the less data rate you can get. And that is something, um, um, a challenge we are, we are trading off. And um, having said that, it is possible, however, to, to build um, to build um, communication systems with off-the-shelf solar panels, and we have done that in, in with, a, with a prototype. I'm coming in a minute, but there is other devices uh, other than silicon-based solar cells. If we go into the gallium arsenide, so three five semiconductors, um, they are much smaller, more expensive. But those gallium arsenide-based technologies allow us higher bandwidth of a solar cell. And what do you what we've shown here is a collaboration with the German Fraunhofer in Freiburg who are leading this development with world record quantum efficiencies of these devices. If you look at their left plot, uh, close to the, um, the, the shortcut, we get one gigabit per second with a single solar cell, with a single element. Um, and if you go and look at the, uh, the data rate you would get in the maximum power point is still about 850 megabit per second. Uh, so there's a path to use those devices to build receivers as well that receive data at gigabit speeds and harvest energy from the light that is carrying data, but also from the ambient light. And we use optimum bit and power loading as you see on the right. So really that gives us the opportunity to build more available, higher availability in addition to sort of the, the satellite systems. And uh, here's a, a classic example of a use case we see uh, depicted of a, a little sort of a hamlet in, uh, in, 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 in Scotland where no one would ever dig up that, that rocky terrain here. Uh, so really need to rely either on satellite or on free space optical systems. And that the, the beam acquisition and, and tracking is, is the most expensive part of an FSO system. If you can get rid of this and use our entire sort of solar roof, as a detector that would give us room to build more affordable FSO systems. And, uh, and, and um, I mentioned that a solar cell is a small device, but we would arrange the solar cells in a new design of a solar cell that this forms a massive MIMO receiver. So we can tap into each individual channel individually uh, and something we, we are going to exploit. And here is a, is a real world system that we've built at the island of Orkney, that's Northern, part of, of Scotland is part of a 5G trial. You see off the shelf solar panels here and then you see this, um, the, uh, the apparatus in front, it's a laser transmitter using these VIX cells uh, for eye, uh, you basically used eye safety, um, uh, a face recognition VIX cell here to build such a system. And we have two of these systems uh, on that lighthouse, basically providing connectivity to two homes next to the lighthouse. Uh, we couldn't drill holes into that building because it's a listed building. That's why I put sandbags on it. And it stood there for three months and it operated for three months without, without interruption, without beam tracking because our detector is so large. So here's a plot of data rates you would get. Uh, obviously, if there is rain, data rate drops and we have 10 megabit per second that we delivered. Best worked at night. Uh, sunlight you see has an effect as we, we have looked at earlier but it never dropped to zero. And um, I needed to say here is that the homes we provided connectivity with, they were living on copper connections, ADSL of two megabit per second. And, uh, and as an incident, one of the, the homeowners bought themselves a 4K TV prior, for, uh, prior to us installing that and they couldn't really obviously use it, but, but only, only we, got, we got them the system running, uh, they, they could enjoy 4K TV, high definition TV. So very low cost, affordable FSO systems are possible. And I want to um, add sort of a last point is security, which is a really important part as we move along our communication systems and develop our 6G vision. Optical wireless has unique features because light doesn't go through walls. I mean, that's a no brain. I mean, that's similar effect we see in, in radio as well with millimeter wave and terahertz, but it is a real 
part um, um, limitation, but also a limitation that comes with opportunities. First of all, you don't create interference into the other room. And the other one is you keep your signals in there. If you, come, if you pair this capability with the directionality that I've, I've said earlier, you can also build more secure physical layer systems inside a room. And, and there's studies that, 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 that's been done here uh, on using sort of some of the more energy efficient sort of um, modulation schemes such as spaceship keying or spatial modulation with multiple transmitters in a room. And, and what, what the plot here is um, the, uh, the bit error ratio of Eve in a room uh, of size three by uh, uh, three by six meter, I believe. And you see two uses here, these red squares, user one and user two. And um, in this scenario, Eve is listening, want to listen to user, to, 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 to their user one, which is seen more to the left. And you see how rapidly the bit error ratio decays away from the, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the desired user. Uh, so the, that essentially means that Eve can only get probably sensible information when it's very close to the, the desired uh, the de desired user, and that means it creates that bubble of security within such a connection. And there's certainly much more work that needs to be done, but um, there's 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 a great uh, opportunity to use the properties of light to build more secure physical layer systems. And that actually brings me to the end uh, of of my talk. Um, and I basically want to conclude on those four pillars that I've mentioned is we have the devices out there um, that we don't need to develop right now to build terabit per second wireless networks. And at the same time, have these devices harvesting the energy from the desired signal, but also from ambient light to build more energy efficient systems. Um, so there is a way, therefore, to build sort of systems that go to um, um, uh, very low uh, energy consumptions into regions of uh, picotule per bit. The directionality is a great enabler, a, a great enabler to build a number of advantages into the system, such as densification, such as point to point and long range, and also extending that to satellite communications, so covering links up to more than uh, sort of a thousand kilometers. So we essentially really see, and that's that's a plea and a, a vision is that. A paradigm shift in, in 6G, in my view, is really when we bring together all the advantages that, that the sort of fiber world has created and merging and marrying them with, with wireless communications and the, the, the cellular paradigms and all the fundamental technologies we have developed there, bring those together, create sort of, for me, uh, an explosion of, of opportunities uh, in, in, in 6G. And I hope I, I hope I haven't bored you too much, but I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Harald, for this fiery keynote lecture. Much enjoyed it. And really, you took us through uh, from science fiction to engineering practice uh, all the way in uh, the north of Scotland, Orkney Island, and so on. I also very much liked your spectrum harmonization uh, approach and petahertz uh, optical wireless. So we've got time for a couple of questions while uh, we're getting ready for the next keynote. Anybody has any? Okay, I'll come over. Our past president has a question here. So this is an important one. Need to be careful. Yeah. Uh... Thank you for the uh, interesting talk and then the, uh, yeah, it will be very useful in getting the, uh, the high data rate information in indoor. But in case uh, of uh, the uh, widely moving terminal, like uh, a person having the uh, VR headsets, they, that, that person can move very wildly upside, even upside down. Yes. In that case, yes. it might be very difficult to have a, uh, the connection, yes, the, uh, you know, you know, the, yeah. to the receiver, it, it has very uh, some difficulty in pointing toward the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the yeah. transmitters. Yeah, yeah. How could that problem be solved? I, I've tried to sketch the solution of the problem with the angular diversity receiver. Really, the the solution is diversity. Um, so uh, you could 
you could basically build an omnidirectional receiver with, with these devices. If you put if a cube and you have a, uh, a detector at each side of the cube with a 45 degrees field of view, uh, there's, there's work that shows that you can build an omnidirectional receiver and transmitter. It's really building on that concept of angular diversity, multiple detectors. And these detectors are not expensive. So you really can build a sort of a, uh, sort of an insect eye structure I've tried to, to show with the, with the receiver where we have multiple multiple segments of receivers pointing in slightly different directions. And then you have always one that, that basically captures the signal. And, and, and obviously we have also reflections of, of the ground and, and so on. So it's, this signals can be picked up. But that's an important question. That's really, that's really the fundamental difference from maybe people always ask what's different to IRDA so IRDA, that have been around for 20 years and that's really going away from this point to point connectivity and allowing exactly what you said mobility random orientation also allowing blockers to happen but uh, but that's 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 where a lot of research went in and obviously it's much more to be done and to invite everybody here to solve and continue solving these these challenges yeah thank you so much Harald. We're really here for this kind of discussion, yeah. deep-rooted dilemmas, and you know we're never going to get uh, so many people together in one room solving these big open problems. Yeah. Uh, you know, your talk reminded me of this room. You know, you've got all these ceiling lights and your wonderfully animated video where you used uh, cell-free systems, and you know we can move around and right. uh, AI could be used in order correct. to switch the beams, et correct. cetera. That's so correct. really, Absolutely. really new uh, science fiction-like opportunities for us to turn into reality. Yeah. Uh, we, we just have time for one more quick question, perhaps, and then uh, we will go on to the next keynote. There. Thank you, Harold. Paul Ferber from Satellite Catapult. Um, of course, I'm very interested in the potential for using it for inter-satellite links, but right. being, being as it's the Vehicle Technology Conference, yeah. um, do you see a time when, just like Volvos always used to have their lights on, that we'll have uh, this kind of optical communications for V2X in the future? I think, thank you for, for making that, that connection. And that's part of the autonomous vehicles and um, the devices that I showed you earlier that basically where we build a 100 gigabit demonstrator, these devices are now in car headlights. So they made it into car headlights because of the higher light output that you can generate with lasers, the higher dis distance it can cover. So there's an, I mean, there's a device in a car already that allows us to build car to car communication. And technically this is all feasible. It's all around standardization. So how do you have um, brand X talking to brand Y. Now, these are more the commercial questions, but car to car, car to X communication. Imagine your street lights. I mean, I always say the street lights are the street furniture that can be built, be used to build your very dense cellular system inside a city. Don't need to have more base stations erected around it. Use the, 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 the lights. And then during daytime, use the infrared channel to the pedestrian because that's where the pe pedestrians are. On the pavement and also allow the, the the street lights to connect to cars in order to really get the control of these cars that need communication skill uh, to indoor, uh, basically to the network as well in a secure way these are scenarios really we see with that technology it's not only an indoor technology but can be rolled out as i showed earlier with my entry slide from really connecting in, in vitro uh, essentially if you want to do that and also read it into deep space as well. So satellite, satellite, uh, satellite to ground, and also missions to when people want to really move to Mars. Right, well, thank you so much, yes. So uh, there will be an opportunity tomorrow. There is a panel session at 11 o'clock after the keynotes to continue these discussions because we really want to